Hey, Uncle Mark. Hello. Uh, when when was the last time you visited the land of Dr. Pepper? <laughs> <laughs> is he is he from somewhere? <laughs> Are we recording? <laughs> <laughs> Where the fuck is Where's, Where's the land of Dr. Pepper? Uh, Pe- Dr. Pepper Pepper was, town? was invented in uh, and is still very, very popular in a small town in Texas. Is that true? Yeah. Uh, and, and I've been there, and I believe that you've been there, and I believe that Uncle Doug is going to tell us a little bit about something I, on else. On this episode of Soda Talk. <laughs> Pop Talk. <laughs> it's Pop Talk with uh, Uncle Doug. The uh, origins of well, your favorites. I'm going to have to rewrite drink. my bit, but here we go. <laughs> um, so... Dear uncles, we've often looked at, uh, into the dark corners of the religious universe at various wackadoo sects and cults. Yes. However, there are only a handful that sit in the cult hall of fame. Jim Jones in episode six and Heaven's Gate in episode 61, for example. Uh, there are many others. Uh, today's cult certainly belongs in their ranks, as it will be the 26th anniversary of their quite literal flameout. Sorry. Ooh. I want to talk about the Branch Davidians. Oh, um, yeah. Yeah, I know. I'm, I tried to keep my... <laughs> Uh, fi- fire jokes to a minimum because it's not really very funny. Sponsored by Dr. Pepper. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, the Brent- I'm sorry, uh, just to explain, Waco, Texas has two things going for it. It has the Branch Davidians, the Branch Davidians and Dr. Pepper. It was the only thing I could think If I were them, I'd lean heavy on the Dr. Pepper. Yeah, yeah. right? Well, Jesus doesn't give with both hands. <laughs> <laughs> Prune soda. Let's so, go. The uh, Branch Davidians, a- uh, AKA, a.k.a. the Branch, were formed in 1955 from a schism in the Shepherd's Rod Davidians, itself an offshoot of the Seventh-day Adventists. We're big fans of schisms here. That's (laughs) right. (laughs) And rods. (laughs) Uh, The Shepherd's Rod Davidians were formed in 1929 when its founder, uh, one Victor Hotef, was disfellowshipped for heretical beliefs. Namely, he thought that the Seventh-day Adventists were too soft and needed to tighten up. Uh, It's always a good sign when a member of your strict religious cult thinks you're too lax. Yeah. Uh, Hotef we, pub- we've had some of those in Mormonism, for we've sure. We've had more than a few. And, yeah. Uh, Hotef published his seminal work, The Shepherd's Rod, which unfortunately is not a romance novel set in rural, rural Wyoming. The book was a typical apocalyptic religious pablum, uh, listing many perceived abominations in the modern world, speculating on the identity of the 144,000 from the Book of Revelation, mm. and his own special interpretations of the Book of, book of Isaiah, which is where all lunatics go to give scriptural validity to the voices in their heads. Yeah. So it was this Hotef guy who took this new church and settled them in Mount Carmel near Waco, Texas, home of Dr. Pepper. Um, <laughs> we could just, let's just keep hitting that. <laughs> let's see if we can get Dr. Pepper to sponsor, <laughs> sponsor <it. laughs> Dr. Pepper and Wonder Bible. <laughs> do, do great taste. They go well together. <laughs> Oh, okay. I hate Dr. Pepper. <laughs> I hate it so much. So I actually <laughs> adore Dr. Pepper. My favorite soda, bar none. Oh, it's so gross. I'm anyway. a Mr. Pib guy. You know what? I like Mr. Pib, but when people compare the two, I get angry because oh. one of those actually went on to get a post doctor, a, 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 a advanced degree, and I think we need to be more respectful. We're about to have a schism on the podcast. <laughs> Uh, so Mount Carmel, incidentally, was named after the place where Elijah called the Israelites back to worship God. Sure. Quick great. question. Is there a square foot in Israel where some prophet didn't call the Israelites back to God? I don't <laughs> think so. It's a great question. No, they kept finding their way away from God. <laughs> like, like, it was amazing how quickly they the did The second too. he walked out of the room. <laughs> if you, if you, literally, if you read any part of the book, yeah. like the, the good guys are straying from God that page or the page thereafter. Moses goes to take a dump and it's golden calf. <laughs> the, 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 the Jews are the least dependable people in it's, the history of literature. It's literally the, mo- the largest case of mass ADHD that has ever yeah. been recorded. They had gold smelting technology <laughs> on the standby. The fire's always burning. Yeah. Okay, back to the Branch Davidians. Uh, the sect actually grew into the tens of thousands in the early 1950s, but after Hotep's death in 1955, the sect split into several factions. Hotep's wife seized power but couldn't prevent the church from fracturing. And so yeah, se- she was a woman. That's right. Um, several months later, a guy named Benjamin Roden founded the Branch Davidians. Now, this splinter group of a splinter group believed in some things that were even too weird for the Rodites, like that the Holy Spirit is a female, for example. Oh, oh. Yeah, strange stuff. Yeah. Uh, a girl ghost. That's right. A lady ghost. <laughs> <laughs> now I've heard everything. Um, Incidentally, the term branch in their name does not refer to the fact that they branched off, which is what I always thought, uh, but that they were anointed as the branch, uh, the holy branch in the book of Zechariah 3.8 and 6.12. 
goes on to say, listen, high priest Joshua and the people with you, you stand for things that will happen. I am to bring a branch, a servant called Branch, blah, blah, blah. So that's where the Branch and Branch Davidians comes from. I feel what does like, that mean, a servant called Branch? They, his name is Branch. That's what it says. It says, yeah. Or is it a, just a branch, like a uh, limb of a tree? It goes on to say, I'm going to bring my servant called the Branch. Your name is Branch. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, feel like, I feel like the uh, eventually... All of the crazy cults are going to run out of ex- incredibly obscure Bible passages I, to name themselves I after. Agree. I'm just worried. I agree. Wor- I know. It's then like again, the, it's a very long book. The more the more it. esoteric it is, the more validity it has. Something like yeah, that. the snake handlers are the Church of God with signs following. That's right. <laughs> we're I love. Yeah, we're the, we're the begats. That's what our <laughs> cult is called. We're, we're the and Jesus wept. We're the golden weasels. <laughs> and uh, and so, it came to passes. <laughs> Uh, Benjamin Roden died in 78, and after a brief power struggle with his wife and son, Vernon Howell took command of the Davidians. Uh, Vernon Howell, a.k.a. Uh, David Koresh, we'll get to that. Oh, I thought uh, Vernon Howell, I thought you were going to talk, you were talking about the old guy on Gilligan's Island. <laughs> <laughs> yep, <laughs> and that's why everybody died at the end of Gilligan's Island. That's right. <laughs> it's been a giant fire. So, uh, the- Janet Reno busts onto the <laughs> island. <laughs> oh, no. no. <laughs> Uh, George Roden, who was the son of the previous Roden, wasn't going out without a fight. And in a series of events that would preview what was to come in all their well-armed stupidity, young Roden challenged Vernon Howell to raise the dead as a contest to see who should run this religion. <laughs> That's and, a great one. And in preparation for the showdown, Roden exhumed a body for the demonstration. Oh my so, God. Instead of meeting him on the field of dumbass... Howell saw an opportunity to simply get his rival arrested for the crime of grave robbing. (laughs) (laughs) This led to a a raid by Vernon Howell and seven of his followers on the Mount Carmel compound in in 1987. Uh, Although they brought an astounding amount of weapons uh, and ammunition, they failed to bring a camera to capture the evidence. So this led to a trial that ended with no one going to jail. No word on what became of the corpse. So Vernon Howell now ascended to the leadership of the church and changed his name to David Koresh, humbly referring to King David and Cyrus the Great. Koresh is Hebrew for Cyrus. Ah. So, oh. humble man. Yeah, yeah. So, and, so and, often and, true in, in, in cultish prophets. That's there. right. And both anti-heroes in, uh, in uh, uh, biblical... Well, they certainly, they certainly dovetail with his own personal proclivities. Well, it's so interesting. I mean, those are both... When you hear Christians trying to be okay with Donald Trump... It's Cyrus. It's yeah. Cyrus and David. Those That's are right. the two that yeah. they talk about nonstop. Well, he's not perfect, but, uh, but you know, Cyrus was yeah, not exactly. even... A, he was not a Christian. Yeah. I mean, he's almost perfect, but... <laughs> right. So in, in, in what followed in a move that we uh, former Mormons will find inevitable... Koresh started taking wives. <laughs> right. Some were single women at the compound, some were the wives of his other followers, and some were children as young as 12. Classic. Classic. Yeah. Oh, who could have seen it? Yeah. Start, I mean, it's really why you start a religion. That seems to be. True to form. Uh, in the next few years, the Davidians abandoned many of the beliefs uh, that their predecessors had espoused and became enthralled to, the, to Koresh's new brand of millennial interpretations of the Bible. He especially claimed to be the world's preeminent scholar on the book of Revelation and the seven seals found in it. Now, in episodes 58 and 60, we covered this subject, and to call the book open to interpretation would be an understatement. Uh, But Koresh insisted that the Davidians refer to themselves as students of the seven seals going forward. So, (laughs) well, that's pretty important. Of the many cults we've covered on this show, some put the charismatic into charismatic cult leader, like Jim Jones or Joseph Smith. Sure. Some, however, like Maharaji or L. Ron Hubbard, are beyond my understanding as to how you could follow such sloths. <laughs> <laughs> however, David Koresh, I get. Uh, he, is no doubt, uh, he is no doubt about it, a child-raping murderous monster. But if you watch the YouTube videos of his preaching, there is something there that is intriguing. And so I kind of get how he could have done this with, yeah, but he credulous wasn't, people. He wasn't like the, the kind of – he wasn't a charmer. He, but he he was he was intriguing. He, yes, exactly. He had this sense about him of like he had an intensity. Yeah, it was. Yeah, yeah you felt you you definitely felt like oh shit. Yeah. And he was a handsome. He was a handsome man. He had a very you know interesting way of preaching, and he had that kind of uh, street preacher mentality where he was in the room with you and and had the Bible open all the time. I get it. I mean, I don't get it, but I get it. Right. Yeah. Um, anyway, um, <laughs> Doug is very vulnerable to <laughs> charismatic, <laughs> handsome men. That's I've, right. I've gotten him out of more than one pickle. If, if you are if, one if you want, if cult you, leader, reach us at at howtoheretic dot com. That's right. If you, if you would like a new member of your cult, <laughs> write to Uncle Doug at 
so Koresh began preaching that the end of days were nigh and that the final showdown would be between the faithful and Babylon, which he identified as the U.S. government. In, oh, of course. That's Classic. right. In preparation for this inevitable showdown, the Davidians, who were already well-armed, began seriously stockpiling weapons. Uh, remember that only months earlier, in August of 1992, was the Ruby Ridge incident. Uh, for those who don't remember, I'm sure most of you do, that's where Randy Weaver, an anti-government militia member, was living with his family in an isolated hilltop cabin in northern Idaho because his greatest fear was that the government would attack him and his family and take away their guns. So the government attacked him and his family to take away their guns. Right. The and 11th, they killed his dog. The, uh, yes, and his daughter and his son. And his dog. And his dog. <laughs> and and the, the resulting siege also ended up in the death of two U.S. Marshals. So um, this was a majorly fucked up operation with bad decisions and miscommunications galore. The ATF's involvement in this inc- incident was, shall we say, incompetent. That, that would be the, <clears throat> the agency for, the, for alcohol, uh, firearms, and tobacco. Correct. So anxious which, to redeem. Hmm? Which those, those things all make total sense know, to right? group together. Yeah. And they have explosives now. So, yeah. you know, why not reward them with explosives after what they've <laughs> I done? I think they've added radishes as well. <laughs> <laughs> it's a strange portfolio, but an important one. <laughs> it's, like a, it's like a patron saint. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so anxious to redeem their reputation and show that they too could look badass in their gear. On February 28th, 1993, they decided to serve, much, uh, serve search warrants to the Branch Davidians on possible child abuse and gun violations. So what happened next only seems inevitable in hindsight. In fact, the shootout and siege that followed were such a comedy of errors and misjudgments, miscommunications, missed opportunities, and rank, uh, rank stupidity that it's actually kind of amazing that it happened at all. So if one were to decide to act on well-founded accusations of child abuse and weapons violations at a compound of people who believed to the soles of their feet that the impending end of the world would soon come in the form of armed government agents, there are various ways that one could go about this. <laughs> one, might be, one might try to, be, to use the local sheriff, who the members of the compound trusted, as a liaison and begin, to, begin a dialogue. I am not saying that this could have prevented what was to come, but dressing up in black tactical gear and loading up on the top of uh, transports with guns and helicopter support would seem to be a provocative act. So, wait, how do you figure? <laughs> <laughs> the ATF geared up like they were either storming Bora Bora or entering a black neighborhood. It's kind of like a super weird make a wish. <laughs> yeah, <I> totally. <laughs> right? It's like when all of San Francisco turned into Gotham for Batman. That's kid. right. That's, yeah. The ATF is like, well, let's make this happen. You got to give like, the people what they want. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they want it. They, this is their dream apocalypse. Yeah, exactly. So uh, <laughs> they set out extremely heavily armed, but they didn't bring very much ammunition, which is something that will be relevant very soon. Oh, my God. So, so that morning, somehow a local press got wind of the raid, and on their way to try to, to go cover what was about to happen at Mount Carmel, they got lost, and they asked a local mail carrier to find their place to the raid. The <laughs> mail carrier happened to be a Davidian. Right. They asked... I'm sorry, what's the address of the raid? <laughs> yeah, we're going, to, we're going to go cover a raid at the Branch Davidian compound. Do you know where it is? And he's like, I do, as a matter of fact. And wait, before you go, let me just make a quick phone call. Yeah, exactly. A boop, 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 boop. Exactly. So that Davidian raced back and told Koresh what was coming. Amongst the Davidians was a gentleman named Robert Rodriguez, who was an ATF plant. And it turns out the Davidians were wise to him the whole time. Oh. So they brought him up and said, listen, we know what's coming. Go tell him we know. They're walking into it. He did and was ignored. So, wow. Wait, he was ignored by the ATF? He went out and told the ATF, they know you're coming. They're, they're, they're loading guns as we speak. The ATF's like, rock, they, and, rock and roll, motherfucker. We, they we, don't know. We didn't bring a lot of ammo, and we don't have enough gas money to get back. So. <laughs> that is not far off. We're doing this. Exactly. <laughs> so at 9.45 a.m., 77 ATF rolled up in force on the Mount Carmel uh, compound. Piled out of their armored clown car. Pretty much. Uh, David Koresh initially opened the front door and tried to, claim the, uh, tried to calm the ATF. But by then, they were in full berserker mode. Uh, so now, at this point, you have an unstoppable force heading directly towards an immovable object. No one knows who shot first, and it doesn't really matter at this point, but all hell broke loose. Uh, the ATF managed to get ladders on the building and a couple agents inside. It's the footage that we've all seen. Yeah, yeah. But once the Davidians opened fire, the ATF was fucked. Four agents died and 16 were wounded. Five Davidians were killed and an unknown number were wounded. Uh, the Davidians kept up in fire. In the initial volley. In the initial volley, yeah. yeah. Then it settled into this just kind of pitched firefight yeah. uh, for two hours. The Davidians just kept firing on them for two hours until the ATF ran out of ammo Jesus. and were basically sitting ducks. 
So confident were they that Operation Trojan Horse, which oh is what they God. called it, <laughs> would go smoothly, the ATF hadn't bothered to notify any lo- other local And they or had federal. not bothered to build a horse. A handsome wooden horse. <laughs> that's, right. that's, that's rule number one. <laughs> rule number one with Operation Trojan Horse, have just, a horse. It's just the army standing outside the gate. Who brought the horse? <laughs> All right. Lancelot um, Galahad and I will <laughs> leap out of the rabbit. That's right. Uh, I am not here to defend the Branch Davidians, but at this point, they could have absolutely killed each and every ATF member member if they'd wanted to. They had thousands of rounds of ammo, clear firing positions, and a pretty clear understanding of what would have happened if the shoe was on the other foot. However, they allowed the ATF to retreat under ceasefire with their fallen. Uh, now things settled into the famous siege that would last for 51 days. Oh, my God. The yeah. FBI... That's, yeah. That is not a small amount of days. It is not. Yeah. Um, the FBI took over at this point and began negotiating with Koresh, but the assurances... And they brought another box of bullets. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it went, they went down to the local sporting goods store. <laughs> Just one round per cop. It's a bunch of Barney Fifes. Pretty much. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the negotiators would give assurances and concessions to Koresh, but then the tactical teams would back, back away from those. So trust eroded pretty quickly, and you know things could have ended differently, but they didn't. Uh, during the siege, the FBI cut their power and water, uh, shined bright lights into the compound, and blasted loud, loud music and the sounds of animals being killed all night for weeks on end. Jesus oh my god! Christ. Yeah, the sound animals. of rabbits being slaughtered. Yeah, fucking what? Nightmarish. Yep. Uh, yet during the, the the siege, very very few people left the compound, and there they, were children in that compound. Many children, yeah. dozens of children. They're, just, oh my god. Yeah, and they they what they thought was we'll we'll make it hard for them, and they'll give up because these people couldn't possibly believe what they claimed to believe. Well, yeah, I mean that's the thing is that like they're banking on rational on, behavior. On yeah, rational behavior, but they're doing it with fundamentalists. It's right. it's it's like saying, right. well, if we talk to this, you know, this this, this suicide bomber. That's right. He will, he'll clearly not pull the... What they failed to understand is that for the people inside the compound, this they was were playing acting out. rationally. This right. was playing out as expected. Exactly. Yeah, right. exactly. This was just, they're just moving through the David the Koresh process. had told them this was coming and it came. That's right. Yeah, this yeah. Is, yeah at this point, they're fulfilling prophecy. Yep. You're not going to get them to like negotiate this their way This is fucking proof of everything they believe. Yeah, right. They're getting deeper. The yeah. beast is now coming to the, the That's Satan right. himself in Revelation is coming to them and being That's like, right. "Hey, how can we get out of this bind we're all in?" That is right. So, by mid-April, the new Clinton administration had had enough, and Attorney General Janet Reno approved the April 19th raid on the compound. Early on that morning, huge assault vehicles drove up to the compound, punched holes in the walls, and began pumping CS gas or tear gas in. The expectation was that it would become so unbearable inside the Davidians' compound that they would finally come out. It, it did. It, well, it did, yeah. <laughs> After six hours of nonstop pumping of this gas and ramming holes in the walls, the Davidians had not come out. Oh, None God. of them had come out. That's crazy. Uh, it turns out that one thing you often buy when preparing for the fiery end of the world is gas masks. Right, yeah. So then around noon, three fires started nearly simultaneously inside the compound and spread quickly. Who started the fire remains a mystery to this day. Uh, depending on who you believe, uh, it's a pretty hotly contested issue. Well, it's something that we can't know. It's, but, I mean, it's equally plausible That's right. that the ATF, either accidentally or on purpose, probably accidentally, but who knows? Right. At this point, they're, they're, they've acted so stupidly. They, they don't deserve the credit. Maybe, that, yeah, that's right. The maybe, benefit of the doubt at all. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Maybe somebody said, well, maybe we can smoke them out if yeah. we start a fire. I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but it's difficult to watch what went down and not feel that something had gone Terribly wrong. But it's also not impossible to believe that David Koresh himself, a right. doomsday fucking cult leader, could start a fire in his own compound right. and point, say we're all going to heaven now. At, at, yeah, and at that point realizing he's out of options. That, and that's, that's certainly possible. In fact, plausible. The one thing I'd say is that uh, you know, many of the survivors, there were a few, uh, all claim that although they were millennialists, they were not a suicide cult. They never talked about mass suicide. Right. They, they didn't prepare for mass suicide. But maybe with his back against the wall, that's what he decided to do. Um, I mean, that's kind of what, what Jonestown was. Right. Um, as the hot and unrelenting Texas winds whipped the fire into an inferno, we've all seen this footage, only nine Davidians uh, were left or were thrown free from the burning compound. The remaining Davidians, including dozens of children, died in the fire and the collapsing buildings. Ugh. Some suffered gunshot wounds, including Koresh and his deputy Steve Schneider. Some children were shot, presumably to spare them from the fate of burning to death. Oh. Many families sought refuge in a buried school bus that must have become one of the worst nightmares imaginable. Like I said, I'm not... Yeah, that, con- the school bus was meant to be like a, a like bunker. A it was like a shelter. bunker, yeah, in case yeah. of bombing. It was a buried right. school, That's yeah. That's right, yeah. buried school bus. 
Now, again, I'm not a conspiracy theorist, but I would just simply say that this could be a really good place to apply Hanlon's razor. Never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. Indeed. So, uh, many people did see this as deliberate plot by the, by the government to cleanse the righteous from the earth. Among them, of course, was Timothy McVeigh, yeah. who did spend a few days in Waco during the siege. Uh, and this incident still gives a lot of energy and life to religious millennialist cults to this day. And we should remind people that McVeigh was the one who, on the anniversary of the siege, blew up the federal building in Oklahoma, in Oklahoma, City, Oklahoma killing City. 160 plus yeah. people. Yeah. Um, and one thing the ATF got so wrong is we were another talking Christian about another Christian terrorist. We should another Christian terrorist. Yes. Uh, one thing the ATF got wrong was thinking these people didn't really believe what they claimed to be- to believe, which is ironic because I'm sure most of them were Christians. Yeah, but they they ab- well, it's not ironic because probably the way that they were Christians, they didn't believe what they were what they purported uh, to fair believe. Fair enough. So uh, most, uh, I mean, cult leaders or cult members. Like intense little sects of religion are the true believers. That's right. Yeah. Re- regular old Christians. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. They, what a confluence of they, terrible fucking. They believe it on every third Sunday when they're actually dragged to church. That's and right. then they kind of don't believe it when they're out fishing. Now, Douglas and I went to the, the remains and I, sw- I seem to remember that school bus is still yeah, there. Yeah, it's been, it's been dredged out, yeah, I guess, yeah. from when it was a crime scene. I was still there too. There. Yeah, yeah, it's still there. It yeah, was it's an eerie spot. It's a crazy, crazy. Uh, it, yeah, it doesn't. And it's you know it's still there's still a church there yep. yeah and there's still but it most of it's gone there's foundations all, all the giant building yeah. that they were all holed up the, in is the one thing we recognize gone. and people would recognize from the aerial footage is the pool right that's still there which well, is the, the foundations of the the building the basement that's is right. still there yeah and it's full of water and reeds and when we were there all you could hear were box turtles shells bonking around yeah hmm. it was pretty crazy and it was really strange. Yeah, and it's it's I mean, it's a hugely dark chapter in American history, and no one was really held accountable for it. Well, and what's interesting is that this is uh, this story is not a story of a it's a it's a story of not a cult gone wrong, but a society that didn't know how to deal with a cult. Right, and I don't know that we've learned any lessons. I mean, I don't know that we. Uh, no, I mean, yeah. we look at it, you look at how the American government thinks it should deal, especially. Well, anybody they think how they think they should deal with uh, Islamic fundamentalists right. or whatever, and the idea is always find a way to further antagonize. That's right. Let's or, make it worse for them. Or maybe you know the the problem we have in this state and, and neighboring states, the polygamous cults like Warren Jeff's cult. The, the, the maybe post Waco, the whole thing is just leave them the fuck alone. Right. Well, and that's the other yeah, and that and and then you're falling way too far on the side right. of where you're not protecting these children and, and right and people that are being abused by them. Yeah. So yeah, I mean Utah has been notorious for just sort of ignoring looking the other way. Yep. Yeah. Even though you know it's even though you'd think that like these uh, these polygamist cults would be a black eye. Well, for, you got to think that any law enforcement officer walking up towards any religious cult has in the back of his mind Waco, and yeah. you know probably lays off to a to a shocking degree. And we we know that I'm sure those guys are armed to the teeth down there. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, so all this has been is uh, good solutions, good answers. Yes, fun, fun stuff. Yeah. Happy happy days uh, in in Texas. Yeah. And so, thanks to our sponsor, Doctor Pepper. <laughs> so this message has been brought to you for Suicide Cult Watch <laughs> once again. <laughs> All right. All right. Let's move on. 